Hello, I'm Dennis Tucker. And I want to welcome you to Book, Chapter, and Verse. This program is being brought to you by the West Side Church of Christ. I hope that you'll take the opportunity for about the next 30 to 40 minutes to sit down to take a little bit of time to open up your Bible, study along with us. Well, the building of West Side Church of Christ, by the way, is located at 4201 Bent Tree Drive, Allensburg, Kentucky, 42301. We hope you'll come be with us. On Sunday mornings, our time of services, we have Bible classes at 9.30, then at 10.30, a time of worship. 6 p.m. Sunday evening, we meet to worship again. And Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we have Bible classes for all ages. Last week, we were studying about humanism, talking about that. And as we did that, we simply gave a definition of humanism. Uh, the, I guess the most simplest, most basic definition or explanation of it would be that man is the totality of all that there is. There is no God, that man is simply a physical being, and therefore we live just for this life right here. There are some that espouse what we talked about, the Humanist Manifesto. That was the first one that was done in 1933, the second one in 1973, 40 years apart. And of those two documents, basically they are saying that we need to forget about religion, forget about God, and simply try to fulfill ourselves, try to be the best kind of people we can be. And this lesson here, this time, we want to talk about the many faces of unbelief. You know, sometimes people can get to the same place in different ways. And so we may be able to do that, and I know in talking to people, uh, sometimes a person that I may even agree with I may come to the same conclusion I have, but their logic is totally different. Their way of getting there is totally different than why, the way that I've got there. And sometimes maybe a person disagreed with my conclusions by agreeing with some of what they say. Uh, there's different ways of getting to the same point. And that's what this lesson is talking about, the many faces of unbelief. Let me explain it to you like this. Why are people atheists? We may say, well, uh, people are atheists because they simply don't believe in God. Well, that's true. That's what definition of atheist is. But however, why? Why is it that somebody says, I'm an atheist? And you start thinking about it, there are various reasons why people come to that belief or that hold that ideology. Uh, some may be because, as you look at it, they are simply angry, what we call angry atheists. Uh, this would be the person, maybe that they lost their loved one in an auto accident, they sent their son to war and they got killed there, there maybe a a child or a parent or some other loved one had a heart attack or had some kind of cancer, some other type of disease, and died. And that person's angry about that. They, they feel as if something you know, unjust has happened to them. And therefore, their viewpoint is, if that, if that is the kind of God that exists, and they don't want that God. They don't want to believe in God. And so there are some that would be classified as angry atheists. Then you have another category, and that would be the amused atheist. Uh, those will be the one that consider themselves to be intellectually superior to everybody else. Uh, they're smarter than anybody else, so they figured this out. And they view people that believe in God as being simpletons, or being ignorant, or being foolish, and so they are the, the, really the superior people. Then you have another kind of atheist that we call the behavioral atheist. This is the kind of person, for instance, the homosexual. He looks at the Bible, or she looks at the Bible, and finds that homosexuality is condemned. Number of passages, Romans 1st chapter. Uh, you look in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 9 through 11, and it condemns the sin of homosexuality. So they look at their lifestyle and realize that if I accept the existence of God, if I accept the Bible as a word of God, then I'm condemned. So it's a lot easier simply to reject the Bible and reject God. But if their lifestyle was allowed in the Bible, if the Bible says it's okay to live a homosexual lifestyle, they wouldn't have any problem with it then. They would not have a problem believing in God. But then there's another kind of atheist. That's the argumentative atheist. And we know the kind of person. The kind of person that says the sky is blue and they don't argue with you that it's green. Or the kind of person that says that something is uh, true because you can't prove it's false or that's false because you can't prove it's true. They simply want to argue about everything. Then you have also the atheist contrarians. And those are a person that wants to always be in the minority. If 99% of the people believe in God, then they're going to be an atheist. However, on the other hand, if 99% of the people were atheists, then they would believe in God. 
may simply want to take the opposite point of view of most other people. Then there's also the atheist that would be the Marxist atheist. Uh, this is the kind that believe that the government and the government institutions are really what matters, that, uh, and God rivals those things. You know, certain countries, like China, for instance, uh, they don't want people believing in God. Well, why? Because they want our, uh, the people's allegiance to their government. And they view any belief in God as a rival to the, the government, what they owe the government. There are people like that, that believe our first allegiance, the only allegiance can be to the powers of this world. Then also you have some atheists that would be simply individual atheists. Or uh, amoral e egotism, egoism, as I describe it here. And that is those who believe that they're afraid of doing anything they want should supersede any belief in God. And, and therefore, maybe any uh, creed or more restrictions they see as being unjust, uh, being placed among God or anybody else. So they simply say, okay, then we can't have that. We can't allow God to exist because he's going to restrict uh, what we can do. I believe when you look, you think about our president, about our Congress, uh, that you see this idea that no one could tell us how to live. That, that kind of person, that kind of philosophy. Then also you look and you find that there are some that are atheists, that are simply narcissistic atheists. Those who believe they should be able to do whatever they want, anytime they want, and basically they are dishonest, it doesn't matter, they simply, whatever centers upon me, and so God takes away from me, and so I can't believe in God, I can't allow God to exist, is how they view it. And, there, and so there are different ways, you see, people can become atheists. Well, there's, as you look at the face of unbelief, and there's three main areas we want to touch in this lesson. And that is some say, well, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe in the Bible, I don't believe in the idea of morality because they are skeptics. And this would be the idea of skepticism. And a skeptic is a person who doubts there is a God. Now, now this person is not going to say definitely 100% without any doubt that God does not exist. That's not what they're saying. They're simply saying, I don't know he exists, and you know what? I just kind of doubt he does. I really don't believe he does exist. And so they hold to the doctrine, basically, that true knowledge or knowledge in a particular area is uncertain, and who has doubts concerning basic religious principles? They would say that we can know nothing for certain, especially when it comes to God, especially when it comes to idea of morality and the Bible and what we, how we should live our lives. And so this is the skeptic. Now, this, the skeptic does not accept anything they have not personally experienced. In other words, you may say, okay, I've seen the Grand Canyon. I'm a skeptic, or you may say that. Let me just put it like this. You may say, I've seen the Grand Canyon. And I say, I don't believe it. I don't believe the Grand Canyon exists. And they may then show me pictures of the Grand Canyon. They may have testimony from other people that have seen the Grand Canyon, from people that have visited and, and actually stayed in the Grand Canyon. The people that have walked through the valleys, through the riverbed of the Grand Canyon, they may say, have people to testify about all that they know and seen about the Grand Canyon, but when you come right back to me, I say, I don't believe it. I just don't believe the Grand Canyon actually exists. Only when I see it for myself, only when I walk the very uh, paths along the Grand Canyon and see it and touch it for myself, then and only then will I believe that the Grand Canyon actually exists. And we look in the Bible, we find that Thomas, we talk, sometimes talk about doubting Thomas, Thomas was one that was a skeptic. That was his point of view. And in fact, we look here in this passage, John 20, chapter, starting verse 24, it said, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with him when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now that is a true skeptic. Now, now when we talk about a skeptic, keep in mind that some are honest skeptics, some are dishonest. Uh, and here Thomas, I believe, was an honest skeptic, but he was a skeptic. He said, unless I see it, unless I... I can feel him for myself. I will not believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And so that is a skeptic. And to, so to the skeptic, everything must be proved scientifically when it comes to humanism. Okay, prove to me 
uh, the existence of God? Can one prove scientifically the, in the existence of God? Can I go to a laboratory and prove that God exists in a lab? Well, how about can one prove scientifically the Genesis account of creation? When we read in Genesis first, second chapters of God creating everything in six days, the order in which he did it, and how he made man and how he made woman, can we prove scientifically? Now, I can prove that the things said in Genesis first and second chapters harmonize with the laws of science, with what we know to be true, but can I actually go and recreate the six days of Genesis? Well, no, I can't, can I? Another thing may be, can one prove scientifically in the miracles in the Bible? When I read of the creation account, when I read of the children of Israel crossing through the Red Sea on dry ground, when I read about the walls of Jericho falling down, when I read about Jesus turning water into wine and all the other miracles in the Bible, can I reproduce those somehow? Can I reproduce those things in the laboratory or out in the real world? Well, obviously not, because miracles are, by the very definition, a violation of the physical laws of creation. And so, no, I can't prove those things. However, you have to think, now, can one disprove all of the above scientifically? Can one disprove the existence of God? Well, we can argue about that, but the atheist has not been able to do that. The humanist has not been able to do that. The evolutionists cannot do that. They cannot disprove the existence of God, can they? If they could, they would have already done that. Or well, can one disprove the Genesis account of creation and Genesis first, second chapters? Again, the same answer goes, no, they cannot, because if they could disprove it, the fact they could not have happened that way, they would have done that. Can one disprove that the miracles of the Bible? Can you prove to me that God did not part the Red Sea? and children of Israel fall uh, woe through on dry ground. Can you disprove the falling of the walls of Jericho or the Jesus turning water into wine? Well, no, he can't. And so the skeptic doesn't want to take a side of the way. So I don't think they're true, but I really, I kind of doubt it. I kind of really doubt that those things are true. And so the skeptic does not know. He cannot really say either way. They're just kind of the middle of the road kind of person. But they they really don't believe it, but they don't really have a reason to to believe it either, so they just kind of stay in the middle. And the problem is, the fallacy is not everything is physical in nature. You see, there are some things we'll look at it that the Bible talks about, and we know to be true, that are real, but they're not physical. Just one example. Love. Is love real? Do we? Can you measure love? Can you take love into a laboratory and see it, put it in a test tube, and and look at it and examine it, can you do that? No, you can't. At the same time, does that mean, though, that love does not exist? When a mother takes her child, newborn child, into her arms and cradles that child, does that mean that there's no such thing as love? A couple that decides to get married to say, I will stay with you the rest of my life because I love you, is that simply a figment of my imagination? Love is something that cannot be measured physically, cannot be seen in the laboratory, but yet it exists. God, when it talks about God, he's not a physical being, he is a spiritual being. Therefore, we can't see God in a physical presence, but yet the Bible says that he exists. And so the fallacy, first of all, is that not everything is physical in nature. The second fallacy is what's called reductionism. And what that means is that you take a complex thing and you boil it down to just one or two things and forget everything about the rest. Uh, you, you may, I'm sure you have heard of the story about the four blind men and the elephant where there's elephants standing before them and each one of the blind men touch a different part of the elephant. One touches the trunk of the elephant and he believes it's a snake. One touches the leg of the elephant he believes it's a tree. The other touches the belly or the side of the elephant, and he believes it's a barn or it's a big house. The final one touches the tail of the elephant, and he believes it is a rope. And, and, and the problem of each one is they are viewing everything by just one little element. Now, reductionism does that, and that it views everything about this world by looking at only the physical part of the universe and nothing else in this universe. And so they're making that mistake as far as 
as how they look at things. And so we look go on here, we find now how again, how do you measure love or morality? How do you measure those things? They exist, but how do you measure them? Well, again, there's a problem there. So they reduce it to the physical without considering anything else beside that one element of our world. And then just look at this here. Okay, going back to Thomas. Thomas said, unless I'm able to touch his side, unless I'm able to put my hand to his finger into his hand and see the prints and touch the nail prints in his fingers or into his hand, I will not believe. Now, was Jesus not raised from the dead just because Thomas had not seen him? The other 11 had seen him, or the other 10 on this occasion had seen him. Does that mean, though, that Jesus had not been raised just because Thomas had not seen Jesus? As we go on in John the 20 chapter, verse 26, 29, it reads to us, And after eight days again his disciples were writ within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And that Jesus is not here today. Now, it would be nice. I would agree. It would be nice if, if he still walked the earth and we could still put our uh, touch him and feel him. But he points out that the next generation would not have him, that he was on a, a sand back into heaven. However, we today, as we read through the Bible, read the accounts of those that did see Jesus, of those like Thomas that did touch him. And Jesus pointed out that basically we are going to accept it by faith based on their testimony, not based on spirit, mere speculation, uh, not based upon mere feelings, but based upon the eyewitness accounts of those that lived in that time period and those that saw Jesus. The same thing about the Grand Canyon mentioned, I don't have to see it personally and know it exists. When I talk to people that have been there, when I see the pictures of the people that took pictures of the Grand Canyon, I can, I can base my belief in the Grand Canyon upon the evidence, by what we know. And so here we have those who are infidels, or the, basically, or the skeptics, excuse me, is a person that basically refuses to accept the testimony of other people. A second type of person is the infidel. Now, infidelity basically is, or infidel is the person who not only refused to believe in God himself, but is also intolerant of and actively opposed to those who do. This will be the kind of person who says, I have the right to make up my mind. I have made it up. I do not believe in God, and I don't believe anybody else should ever believe in God either. In some ways, they're intellectually dishonest because they refuse to grant to everybody else the opportunity to make up their own mind. They're simply an infidel. They want everybody to oppose the existence of God. And we find that Paul, when you read his writings about Christianity, he was, in some senses, an infidel. That Paul in Philippians 3, verse 18 says, For me, walk of whom I have told you often, until you now, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now that is the infidel. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are against everything the cross of Christ stands for. And as you look at Paul when he describes his life, he puts himself in some ways in that category of being the infidel. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 12 to 13, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, now just consider this here, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man by tame mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, he was an infidel. He did not want others believing in Jesus, being the Son of God, but he pointed out that he was receptive to the truth when it was presented to him. But there are some that are opposed to God to the point that they will not even consider the evidence presented to us in the Bible. They don't want to believe in God, and therefore they don't want anybody else to believe in God either. When we look over in Acts the 13th chapter and talking about the Jews in verse 45, 
But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turned to the Gentiles. Now these were Jews that when they saw people obeying the gospel, they just didn't say, oh, well, we'll, we'll leave them alone and we'll go ahead and worship God our way. Uh, but these were people that were actively, you know, uh, violently opposed to the preaching of the gospel of Christ they would be classified as infidels. And so that's why the way they were. And so again, an infidel is simply a person who not only refused to believe in God himself, but also is opposed to anybody else believing in God. Also, reason and logic has little to do with infidelity. Now, I know a lot of times the infidel will say that they have examined this, they studied this for themselves, and there may be a small group of people that really, as they look at the evidence, decide this, but most are infidels because of emotion. And that is really what they appeal to. They appeal to the emotion of not wanting other people to believe in God. Now, let me give you some examples of famous infidels. I'll just give you a few. Voltari. Voltari lived in the 1700s. In 1765, he decided that he did not believe in God. And, and he studied the Bible and said there are contradictions and inaccuracies in the Old Testament. And that was his claim as he looked at the Bible. And as he did that, he also said the miracles in the Bible did not happen. They could not have happened. Now, again, we kind of go back to the earlier point I made of how can you prove that the miracles recorded for us in the Bible did not happen? You can't. Now, I take the fact that they happened based upon faith, based upon what the Bible says, and those who saw the miracles there. The eyewitness testimony of those who witnessed the miracles. The person like Voltaire here would say, okay, I deny the near miracles. I don't accept the eyewitness accounts. I don't accept the Bible. I simply think they did not exist. That was where he came from. He denied God answering prayers. He said it was useless, no reason to pray to God because there's no God to answer our prayers. And if there was a God, then he wouldn't answer our prayers anyway. And he denied all the messianic prophecies in the Bible. Now, when you go back through the Old Testament, and look at the Messianic prophecies, all the way from Genesis, third chapter, uh, all the way to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, you find things such as the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, uh, the time period as far as which kingdom he would be born into, into the Rome, during the time of the Roman Empire, uh, that talks about the fact of him being betrayed by Judas, about the amount uh, that Judas would betray him for, uh, also the manner of death by which he would suffer, his resurrection, and many other prophecies concerning Jesus. Uh, Voltaire simply said, I don't accept them. I, I don't think they're true. And, and so he simply refuses to acknowledge anything the Bible says to really look at the evidence. Now what he did, in fact, he said, he said it took 12 men to originate the Christian religion, but it will take only one to eliminate it. Within 50 years from now, the only Bible will be in museums. Now, that was around 1765. Fifty years from now, the only Bible we'll have be in a museum so people could look at this relic, basically. Well, you know, we still have our Bibles. And I'm not sure about you, but Votari doesn't exist anymore. I mean, he's, he's dead. He's gone. But we still have our Bibles. And, uh, in fact, kind of interestingly, the printing presses that he used to publish his works were bought by the Gideon Bible Society to use to print Bibles. And so that tells us about the effectiveness of this man. Another man is John Dewey. And John Dewey, when you look at his life, born in 1859 in Vermont, he has uh, received a doctorate at John Hopkins, and in 1884 began teaching at the University of Michigan. He became chairman of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education at the University of Chicago. Uh, there is hardly a school system that has not been influenced by the, this man, John Dewey. He is considered to be the, the father of our modern educational system. And John Dewey was a basically a devout atheist. Uh, he was a devout atheist. He wrote what's called a common faith in which he accepted the idea of atheism beyond any doubt. Uh, that he's been simply said that there's no such thing as morality or absolutes. The only absolute is there are no absolutes. 
And so that was his philosophy. And again, he has a, had a great impact, a great influence on our educational system today because as you look at much of the teaching done, it is the idea that we are a morality-free society, that we should not believe in uh, a God or uh, in, in the idea of good and bad, and sin uh, at least. And then we have also Madeline Murray O'Hare. Most of us, at least my age and older, remember this woman, as she basically stood up against the idea of religion in our workplaces and the government and our public uh, buildings or public areas, that there was a court case in 1963 called Murray versus Curlett, uh, or Curlett, and this was the court case that had school prayer taken out of schools. And she said that it was a violation of the separation of church and state. She really wasn't interested, by the way, in the violation of the church and state. She was interested in stopping prayer. Okay, let's make that plain. She did not want people believing in God or thinking about God or praying to God or studying the Bible. And so she took every opportunity she could to fight against public readings of the Bible, prayer in schools or anything else. Uh, she was against those things. She was... In 1963, in a poll voted as, I guess that's what you call it, the most hated woman in America. She herself, in describing her motive and her personality, she said, I love a good fight. I guess fighting against God and God's spokesman is the sword of the ultimate, isn't it? And ironically, again, you may recall that she and a secretary, her son, disappeared uh, and, never, and basically just a few years ago they found her bones that she had been killed. But she did not want her death publicized. She did not want her people knowing when she died because she was afraid they would pray for her. Uh, the one thing, when they had the auction of her assets, the one thing that brought the most money of all her possessions was her Bible. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Well, these are simply infidels, these people that stood up against God. And then finally, you have what's called deism, a deist. And basically, deism comes from the Latin deus, meaning God. And basically, the idea is that it gained popularity as a means to answer problems with atheism and agnosticism. You see, the atheist cannot prove that God exists or does not exist. The agnostic doesn't know. Somebody says, we don't know whether God exists or not. And so the deist said, okay, since you cannot disprove God's existence, and since the ag ag agnostic cannot, uh, says we do not know uh, whether God exists or not, but somebody else out there might know he does exist, since you have that then, they said, the deist says, okay, God exists. We believe that God exists, and he is to be worshipped. We are to do some things to please him, and there will be a future judgment. Now, these points here, I don't have a problem with. Okay, the Bible says there's going to be a future judgment. Uh, the God, Bible says that God obviously exists. And the Bible says to be worshiped in spirit and truth. However, the idea says, but God does not interact or reveal himself to mankind. It is the idea that God, much like a watchmaker, when he puts the watch together, puts it on the table, and then walks away from it. He just lets the watch keep on ticking away until it finally winds down. Well, that's the way the disc views God. He made us, made the universe, but he doesn't have anything. It's kind of like the ultimate hands-off God, if you would. And so that's what they said. And now if you believe that, then you say, okay, Jesus then cannot be the son of God because God's not going to send his son down here. That's impossible for God to do that. And also that, again, they wind up saying the miracles did not happen because the only way they could happen is if God performed those miracles. The prophecies in the Bible could not be true, could not have been accurate, or could not have been said when they supposedly said because, again, that would require the power and existence of God and the Bible itself because it claims to be by inspiration. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scriptures are given by inspiration of God. And so they would say, okay, then those things are not true. And what they have done then is basically said, we deny anything about God revealing himself. And let me, in fact, in, fact, in a 
an article called Ideas of Consequences, actually a book here. It said, God didn't need to reveal anything about himself in a holy book like the Bible or the Koran. Nature itself is the only revelation God needs. A rational man could find out all they need to know about God from nature. Now, the Bible points out to us that God does reveal himself to man in his power by looking at the creation around us. In Psalms 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, we understand that God made the universe. However, you look at the trees, you look at the stars, you look at the marvelous universe we live in, but those things cannot tell you what God wants you to do. Those things may tell us that God exists, but they cannot reveal to us the mind and will of God. And so that's where the, this is. He says, I believe that God exists, but we don't know what God wants us to do. Now, to these people, to the skeptics, to the infidels, to the deists, I believe we have to look at a few things, and then we'll be through in our study. One is that an all-powerful God has the ability to reveal himself to mankind. You just start thinking about that. The deists said, okay, the God that created the heavens and the universe all around us. The skeptic says, okay, God may exist. I don't know if he does or not. But that God that can create everything around us has the ability to reveal himself to mankind. In Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 1, God, who at various times and various ways spoke at time past to the fathers by the prophets. That's what Hebrews 1, verse 1 says to us. First Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy, third chapter, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God is powerful enough to reveal himself to mankind through inspiration. More specifically, through the work of the Holy Spirit as he revealed the will of God to mankind. And so that would be my first thing, is that an all-powerful God has the ability to reveal himself. A second thing also, and, and basically when you think about inspiration, and we have inspiration resulting in revelation that results in enlightenment. The very purpose for the Bible is to let us know what God wants us to do. In Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. Now specifically what the Apostle Paul was talking about is the fact that man can be saved through Jesus Christ, that Jesus and Gentiles both will be reconciled to God in Christ Jesus. But how we know that? By revelation, by him through inspiration, revealing this to the apostles, and then by writing it, revealing it to us. Also Ephesians 5 verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How we know what the will of the Lord is? By reading what the Bible says. And so we look at this here, we have to see then that God has revealed himself to mankind so that we can know his will. The second thing is that an all-powerful God has the ability to perform miracles as proof of his existence and of his revelation. That is, that when we look and we see the miracles performed, why is it that God could not perform those miracles? Why is it? He made the very laws of nature. Why is it he did not have the ability then to actually say, I'm going to suspend those laws to prove that these men are my prophets, to prove that I am inspiring them. As you go on in Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 2 through 4, there the writer says, For the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was, notice this point, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. You see, the Hebrew writer says, we have the proof, the miracles that they performed prove that they were inspired by God, prove the words that we read were revealed to us by God. And so an all-powerful God has the ability to do that. The third thing is an all-powerful God can send his son to reveal the will of the Father. Why not? 
you know, you know, just kind of put it here plainly here, why is that not possible? Those who say, that, we don't believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why? Because when we look at the Bible, we find that it maintains very plainly that Jesus came to reveal the will of the Father. In John 1, verse, 17, verse 15, John 1, verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, that was he who of whom I said, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has preferred before me, for he was before me. Now he's talking about Jesus, but he was before John. Well, how's that? Because, you see, in the order of the birth, John was actually born first, and then Jesus. But John's pointing out Jesus existed before he came to this world. But then also in John 5, verse 36, Jesus says, But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. You look and think about all the things Jesus did in his ministry, the raising of the dead, the healing of the sick, the ability to the blind to see, the stopping of the, the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Those things were all proof, testimony, of Jesus being sent by the Father. And then also John 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures. For in them you think they have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You look at the Bible, they're going to tell you about me coming. Look at the Old Testament, they're prophecies about me. And so they came. They were given so as to testify to us or prove that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And then Hebrews 1st chapter, verse 1. God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. God sent Jesus to reveal himself to us today. So it's ridiculous. When you start thinking about it, it's ridiculous for the skeptic to say, I don't know if God does or does not exist, and then reject the, the one Jesus whom God sent. And it's kind of like here we have the evidence of God's existence, but what we're going to do is we're going to put that in a nice little box, we're going to put it to the side, and we're going to say, now let's pretend that doesn't exist, and you know, I don't know if he does or not. I don't know if God does not exist. Well, the evidence is right here, but they refuse to see it. Also, it's dishonest for the infidel to say, I had decided I don't believe in God, and you can't either. You, know, you, you don't have the intelligence, you don't have the ability to make that decision yourself because I decided that you can't, that God doesn't exist, you cannot, you have to agree with me. That's the infidel. And then finally, it's absurd for the deist to say God exists, that he wants us to our worship, but does nothing. Has not told us how to worship him or how to please him, has not revealed anything to, about himself to us, but we believe in the existence of God. Well, what kind of God would that be? What if God has done all these things? And that's what the Bible says. God has revealed himself to us through this word, through the prophets, through the miracles, through his son. And so we have to take that into consideration when you stop thinking about it. A powerful and loving God can reveal himself. He can send his son to die for us, and he can judge us according to his word. And that's what the Bible says will happen on the day of judgment. And so these are the different ways that people come to the belief of not believing. There are stages of unbelief. I appreciate you watching this program. We're going to talk some next week about, I guess, situation ethics. And we're going to talk about that. But I hope you'll come be with us at the West Side Church of Christ. Again, our building is located 4201 Bent Tree Drive, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42301. Our time services, Sunday mornings, we have Bible classes at 930, class for all different ages. You have young children, we have nursery, pre-nursery classes all the way up to high school, and we have a young adult class along with our auditorium class. And then at 1030, we have a time of worship. At 6 o'clock Sunday evening, we meet again to worship God. Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we have Bible classes again for all ages. If you'd like to contact me, maybe you don't agree with what I said in this lesson. Maybe a subject matter you like to hear discussed in this program, then you can contact me by email, wcoc at bellsouth.net. Again, that's wcoc at bellsouth.net. And also, 
We have a website. I hope you come take the opportunity to listen uh, or to go to it. We have audio sermons on there, uh, I, and you can listen to those sermons. And our website address is thewestsidechurch.us. Again, that is thewestsidechurch.us. I appreciate you watching our program. Hope you'll tune in next week for another edition of Book, Chapter, and Verse.